everyone, and welcome to our ongoing series featuring our friends from VikingsTerritory.com. I'm Tom Moore from BikeFans.com, and today our guest is Arif Hassan, who joins us to talk about the very timely topic of analyzing the Minnesota Vikings roster cuts that happened on Saturday afternoon. Arif, welcome to VikeFans.com. Uh, hi, Tom. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, are you ready to talk about the few of the roster moves today? Absolutely. I'm excited to. Great. Well, let's start out with the release of starting safety Jamarcus Sanford. And I wasn't really surprised he's not the starter, but he seemed unprepared for his short-term IR designation he got today. And as I understand it, Sanford really doesn't think he's injured to that degree. Can you tell us what the story is, and can the Vikings re-sign him with this short-term IR designation? Uh, So I'm not entirely familiar with how all of the rules are spelled out, but I'll tell you as much as I'm familiar with in this context. So teams will use the short-term IR designation, generally speaking, when a player and his agent cannot agree with the team about the extent of an injury. So that's, in fact, exactly what it sounds like is happening. What that means is that when the player is medically cleared to go, he can then be released. Uh, That's different from an injury settlement, which is what usually happens. An injury settlement is usually when I, an agent and, and the player that the agent is representing has a reasonable degree of understanding that they may be able to get off the injury at a different timetable than the team uh, expects them to, and then the team and the player agree to uh, an injury settlement, you know, similar to workers' comp, that's supposed to provide them with a certain amount of money that represents the amount of time that the player will be out that the team and, and the player's representation can agree to. And it sounds like they didn't agree to that, so we'll just wait it out. Uh, that means when Sanford is medically cleared to go, he will then be uh, cut from the team, which means that they don't have to go through the injury settlement process. I am not confident that they can re-sign with the team immediately. More often than not, this just means that a player won't re-sign with the team. Okay. Then, and obviously, given that he's likely not to be re-signed and Sanford's now being gone, do you think safety Robert Blanton gets the starting nod next to Harrison Smith? And is he ready for that challenge in Week 1 versus the Rams? And he's the only one that's left on the roster that's been taking significant snaps of the ones. And so I think that, you know, barring, uh, you know, another big surprise, you know, this, these roster cops were filled with surprises already. Uh, barring another big surprise, I think that you'd see uh, Robert Blanton start you know, that doesn't mean he's going to start by, by week four, week seven, or week 17, but by week one, uh, I think that he's going to be starting, yes. Okay. And today, with the release of Alan Reisner and Chase Ford, we only have two tight ends on the roster, uh, and that's starter Kyle Rudolph and Rhett Ellison. Were you surprised they released Chase Ford and only kept two tight ends? And should we expect the Vikings to be looking for a third tight end on the waiver wire? Uh, I wasn't surprised that they cut Chase Ford. I guess I was a little surprised that that meant that they weren't going to keep any of the tight ends, uh, I don't know if anyone caught this, but because of this problem, I, in fact, thought that the Vikings were going to keep Mike Higgins on the roster because he had flashed a little bit. Uh, just because of sort of the desperation at tight end, the fact that they didn't get to see Chase Ford uh, play in pads at all, especially in a preseason game, and, and the fact that Alan Reisner can't uh, generate separation or block. So I expected them to keep three tight ends, uh, at least conditionally, until they get to the waiver wire. Uh, it sounds like uh, they're not even going to go through with that. They're only going to keep two tight ends. Uh, they will probably take a look at the waiver wire. Obviously, that's conditional on a lot of things. There's a lot of things that can happen uh, before they can get a tight end that they want. They'll want someone that's familiar uh, with the North Turner system. And I haven't identified a lot of tight ends uh, that are really, you know, all that interesting. So they'll look. Uh, I don't know if they'll find anything. You know, it's interesting because obviously you're so well-connected in the sports community, and fans always have conjecture, and they were all talking about it today on our site, but how do you start to get the leaks of information? Do you actually get it, you know, directly as you start to see it from players, agents, and teams, or do you have inside contacts to get that information a little bit in advance? Uh, I have a couple of inside contacts. It's not nearly as extensive as the people who are are formerly journalists, the people who work for Pioneer Press, Star Tribune, ESPN, etc., uh, you know, their job is to develop those contacts, and they're with the uh, with the team every day. I've got a couple of contacts in the team. It's not very extensive or in-depth. Uh, and then I also, you know, have access to uh, a couple of the players' agents uh, and, and whatnot. The, the dribbles of information I get are not usually unique compared to people at ESPN, the Star Tribune, the Pioneer Press. Gotcha. Well, you know, in those cuts today, uh, running back Joe Banyard led the team in rushing in the preseason. He looked pretty elusive Thursday night against the Titans on his way to a 100-yard rushing performance. Uh, He was let go. Uh, Why do you think that happened, and do you think if he clears waivers, he comes back to the practice squad? Uh, I think if he clears waivers, uh, he will definitely come back to the practice squad. Obviously, the Vikings like him. That's why they brought him back again for this year. And, and of course, he had a a pretty good preseason. I I think the reason that uh, that Banyard got cut instead of someone like Matt Asiata 
uh, who, who obviously would be the other candidate, even though Jarek McKinnon is behind him on the roster. Uh, I think that the reason that he got cut is because he's less reliable in pass protection, which is sort of what, what you want your backup running back to do in that situation. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, you can't trust his vision as much uh, as you can with, with Asiata. Uh, in the case of a backup running back, uh, you're not likely to get that many extra yards beyond what your offensive line can get you, especially in a case where the offensive line is so good at run blocking. So you want someone with good vision more than elusiveness because you don't know what you can replicate uh, based off of you know quickness in the preseason, but you know that mature decision-making is a persistent quality. Gotcha. Well, as we stay with the running back uh, position, there was talk that the Vikings might release Jerome Felton as an expensive contract and keep Zach Line instead, but Minnesota kept both players. Were you surprised by that, and where do you see Line contributing this year? You know, I was actually more surprised uh, that they kept Zach Line because as much a fan as I was of him coming out of SMU uh, this year in the preseason and training camp, I wasn't very impressed with uh, some of the things he put together. There's like the obvious stuff. I remember a drop and a crossing rep from Teddy, but more than that, he doesn't angle well on a lot of these blocks. He wasn't particularly good last year, and it doesn't look like he improved in the context of what fullbacks were traditionally expected to do. He, of course, had a different role at SMU because he ran the ball, even though he was listed as a fullback there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I didn't really expect him to make the roster because I didn't see him outperforming Felton and, and, and Felton is expensive for a fullback, but he still doesn't consume, you know, very much cap space at all. And when, when your forte is Adrian Peterson, you invest a little bit more there. Uh, in terms of how Zach Line is going to be used, uh, you know, that's a mystery to me. I think it's, uh, you know, his usage patterns will be related to the fact that the Vikings don't have, you know, more than two tight ends. I think that he will adopt some of the move roles that Rhett Ellison has and that Rhett Ellison will will shift not just from his H back role where where he lines up as a fullback often, uh but and we saw it in the preseason too. He's he's put out wide far more often in this preseason than he did last year. So I think we're going to see some sort of overlapping responsibilities between Red Ellison and Zach Line. It's not a role I think he's particularly suited for mm-hmm. uh but I think it's probably the best use of the available talent given the scheme. Got it. Before this training camp started, there was tons of talk about Christian Ponder being traded. Are the Vikings just keeping two quarterbacks? Well, you know, as the list came out, Ponder's on that 53-man roster and still with the Vikings. And, uh, Arif, if you look at this, if another quarterback needy team comes in and offers, say, a fifth or sixth rounder, would the Vikings move Ponder? And if so, would they pick up a developmental guy or just go with two quarterbacks? Uh, I think that they would move Ponder. You know, I'd be surprised if the Vikings weren't openly shopping him, although that sort of thing does tend to get leaked out by this point, and it hasn't been. Uh, but still, I, I would be surprised if they weren't at least uh, hinting at other league executives that they were willing to trade Ponder. Uh, so if they were able to get a fifth-round pick for him, I think that they would probably end up doing that. In a situation where they do end up getting compensation for Ponder, I don't think that they would add a developmental quarterback midway through the season. I think instead uh, they would use that extra roster space for a different skill position, probably one that by at that point had suffered an injury uh, just because that's the sort of thing you need to take care of. All right. Well, on the offensive line, uh, draft choice David Yankee made the team, and he beat out 2013 draft choice Jeff Baca. Uh, what did Yankee show that made Baca expendable? Uh, it's not so much what Yankee showed as much as what Baca didn't show because Yankee was not particularly impressive aside from you know one or two qualities of his that I think are superlative. Uh, his, the overall package of Yankee was not particularly impressive in the offseason, uh, in the preseason or the training camp. It was more that Jeff Baca didn't particularly improve. You know, he's supposed to be this mauler who, who plays with a lot of awareness and intelligence, and his run blocking wasn't particularly good. He couldn't sustain his blocks. Uh, he didn't have enough strength to maintain what I guess is an attitude for trying to hit other people, which is, you know, a fine attitude to have, but not something that uh, you can sustain without, you know, some level of physical capability to back it up. And uh, he was a better pass blocker than I had anticipated, uh, but still relatively inconsistent at it, and, and his footwork issues were a problem, too. So I think all of those things combined kept him on the 13. David Yankee, of course, has a, a bit of a longer leash, in part because he's a draft pick mm-hmm. uh, and a rookie, but also in part because he came in a little bit later than everyone else, and so he's given a little bit more. Uh, That and his mental qualities, you know, point to a pretty high ceiling, especially because he has physical qualities. He just has some balance concerns he needs to work out. He has some footwork concerns he needs to work out. Uh, You know, he's an extraordinarily aware guard. He does a very good job at blitz pickup. He does a very good job of providing help to offensive tackles and things like that. Uh, And I think that's the sort of thing that the Vikings saw when they talked to him and when they drafted him. 
uh, that kept him on the roster above uh, someone like Jeff Baca. As you watched him in camp in the preseason, is there anything that would lead you to believe that he's not the heir apparent to Charlie Johnson at the left guard? Uh, yeah, actually. Uh, you know, at the moment, I, I'm concerned about his balance. The likelihood of him making leech blocks or, or, or blocking outside of his frame uh, without the proper balance, I think that, you know, he hasn't been particularly great in this preseason at preventing pressure. You know, right now, Charlie Johnson is, is definitely a better guard than him. Whether or not in the future, you know, he can be, I think that's more up in the air than what I thought before I had entered camp because I had expected him to be a little bit further along. So I would say it is less written in stone than I thought, uh, but certainly all of the qualities he needs to get there are there. That's good. Well, obviously joining him on the offensive line, a couple other guys that people really don't know about, Vlad Dukasi and Adam Wentworth, they're adding the depth. Uh, should we feel concerned as fans uh, about them if they're needed to play significant snaps this season? Well, it depends on what context they play significant snaps. I think the biggest concern for the Vikings right now is tackle depth. Uh, as you know, Antonio Richardson moved to injured reserve uh, as a result of uh, you know injury to his knee. Uh, beyond that, Austin Wentworth is the backup tackle, which is a bit of a problem. They started him out actually at guard, and his projection coming out of the draft was at guard, and he worked most of the offseason at guard. It wasn't until training camp that they moved him you know, back to tackle, the position he played at Fresno State, and his speed issues. Uh, you know, we're evident he doesn't have, you know, extraordinary length to make up for his issues with speed. And when blocking outside of his frame or when blocking on the move, uh, he tends to lose a little bit of strength. All of these issues can be solved by playing at guard, and he tends to drive forward when blocking anyway. So, you know, that that's good for him, and he'd be a good pulling guard. But, you know, at tackle, I'm a little bit concerned. The preseason for Austin Wentworth was actually not as bad as I think a lot of uh, you know, our initial reactions to him might have been, you know, he gave up that sack fumble safety, of course, right away. But beyond that, his pass protection was not extraordinarily poor. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it also just wasn't good. Uh, I don't think that he can stand up to, you know, fast NFL-level defensive ends or outside linebackers. So that's my concern. They even they even played Vlad Dukas, who's pretty much only a guard at tackle at times, uh, just to see what they had. And I think that's an indication that that's something we have to worry about. Well, you know, you, you mentioned that, and obviously Matt Khalil has really struggled, you know, and based on what you're saying, there's really nobody to come in and take his place right now. Do you think the Vikings are scaring the waiver wire for somebody to come in and tackle? Yeah, I think so. The problem, there, there's two positions that tend to be relatively bare on the waiver wire. The first uh, is safety, which is its own unique problem for the Vikings. Uh, but the second is the offensive line, more guard than tackle, but still, uh, it is relatively scarce at tackle. So, yeah, they're scouring the waiver wire at tackle. Anybody who they'd be interested in on the waiver wire is probably somebody that could have attracted to camp as an undrafted free agent or somebody that they would have signed in the offseason, someone like Vlad Dukas. Um So they're probably looking. I don't know that there's anyone on the waiver wire right now that stands out to them that's both uh, a system fit in terms of the multiple responsibilities that Vikings offensive linemen have and a potential upgrade over someone like Austin Wentworth, which is, you know, a little sad given what I, my opinion of him as a tackle is. But still, it's tough. I, I think uh, I think the Vikings are just going to have to find some way, you know, to work around it. I mean, Jamarcus Webb was just cut. They might sign him again. Yeah, I mean, he, I was just going to ask you about Webb. Does he represent an upgrade to Wentworth, or is it pretty much even? You know, I, at the time the Vikings signed him last year, I thought he was a, a decent backup uh, offensive tackle. Right now, I think he's more of a replacement-level player, now that I think about it a little bit more, which goes to show you how awful the Bears' offensive line situation was back when he was starting for them. But I think he's probably better than Wentworth. The fact that Wentworth is an unknown might be intuitively appealing because that you know at least speaks to a potential for upside. I don't think that's the case for him because of his physical capabilities, uh, and I think Webb is probably a better a backup tackle option, and he's familiar with Jeff Davidson and how Jeff Davidson likes his offensive tackles to play. Uh, so that's that's at least something worth uh, noting. Yeah, you mentioned Antonio Richardson going on IR. I understand he's got to have surgery on both knees, and there were times when I was at camp that he looked pretty good, but he did. When he was done, he would limp something terrible. Uh, is his NFL career likely over, or can he recover from those knee problems? I think there's a very, very high chance that his NFL career is over. You know, obviously the Vikings have a very, very good uh, medical staff, and they evaluated you know, Antonio Richardson from a medical standpoint. And, and, you know, I quickly talking to members of the medical staff, they told me that they weren't particularly worried about him. I think a lot of that was for show. Like you said, you know, he, he looked good in camp. And also, 
uh, you know, would occasionally and practice with a limp. You know, you would wear braces at times, and sometimes you wouldn't. Uh, I think in the third preseason game, uh, no, the second preseason game, which I think was the last one he played, he was wearing a brace. And I think that his, his career is over. I mean, the, what I had heard coming out of the draft is that he had osteoarthritis, a degenerative condition that Minnesota fans might be familiar with. It's the same thing Brandon Roy has, mm-hmm. uh, and it's the reason that he can't play basketball. He's losing cartilage in his knee. Uh, the same thing is true of, of Antonio Richardson, based on what I heard in the most recent diagnosis that we had heard from Darren Wolfson over at 1500 ESPN is concurrent with that diagnosis because he's got some, uh, you know, floating cartilage uh, in his knee, and that's that's a symptom of that problem. So, at both knees, uh, it sounds like it might be grade two at best. Uh, the surgery removes the floating bodies, but generally speaking, does not have a way to replace the cartilage. Any experimental surgeries to replace the cartilage are not currently legal in the United States, although you could always go to Germany. So I think that his NFL career is probably over. Okay. Well, what got us to this problem at the tackle spot was what we talked about with Matt Khalil, and and you watched them close enough. You've seen them along the way. What's going on with him? What what has happened? It's so unusual because, uh, you know, I had noticed some problems with him actually this time last year at Camp 2. I had mostly dismissed him because of how strong his rookie year was and that he had a reputation at USC for not being particularly enthusiastic about practice, but showing up in games. You know, the, both of those combined, you know, allow you to, I think, reasonably dismiss an unreliable camp performance and a less than reliable preseason performance. But given how he was last year, I think that that becomes real concern. And he probably played a little bit harder this preseason, too, in order to prove that he was the kind of player that, you know, the Vikings drafted him to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's unusual is that the problems that he had last year do not resemble the problems I'm seeing from him this year. You know, I don't, I don't claim to be, uh, you know, an extraordinary expert when it comes to offensive line play or anything like that, but, you know, based off of what I've seen, the techniques, uh, that he's using or the techniques that he's losing to are different. He got beat to the inside a lot last year and now he's getting beaten to the edge, which is not something I'd ever expected, uh, to see happen to him on a consistent basis given, you know, sort of how athletic he is. We're going to have to watch how that happens, but it's almost like a straight decline. And as you said, it's different things, and it's got to be confounding for both him and the coaches. But, uh, you know, we did have a couple of other guys who made the roster uh, for the 53-man cut, as both receivers, Adam Thielen and Rodney Smith, made it. And I'm curious, uh, Arif, does Thielen offer an immediate impact on the offense during the regular season, or will he be more of a special teams guy? And if both Smith and Thielen perform well, is there any chance the Vikings cut Jerome Simpson when he comes back off suspension? So I'll answer that last question first. I think there's a chance that Simpson could be cut when he comes off of suspension. I think that that chance is relatively low. I think people underrate the talent level uh, of a player like Jerome Simpson, who, when healthy, can regularly put together about 700 yards of offense for any particular quarterback in any year, which is not something you can say for a lot of receivers, especially receivers that are uh, fourth or fifth uh, on the rosters in the NFL. I'm not so sure Thalen and Smith are there yet, especially because they can't develop the kind of separation that he can. So I think the chance is there. I think that that chance is relatively small. As for whether or not Thielen can provide an immediate impact, I think that he's going to have to because they're trying to figure out what to do with Jarius Wright. They're trying to find a role for him. He's very, very talented. His role seems to, you know, last year seems to have been closer to, you know, Victor Cruz's role as a slot receiver than someone like Greg Jennings or someone like Randall Cobb and Percy Harvin. They're all different brands of slot receivers. And Jarius Wright's brand of slot receiver was not something that the Vikings generally had good offensive design to enable. Uh, this year, they're trying to get him to do more stuff, play more like he did at Arkansas, potentially play as a possession receiver as well as a slot receiver. Uh, but if that's not working out, they're going to need Thielen to bring more to the table. He can provide uh, you know, a receiving option at all three receiving positions, at split end, flanker, uh, and in the slot. And I think that versatility will allow him to see the field often enough that he'll probably catch, uh, you know, at least be the, uh, the target of a couple of passes in an NFL game. Okay. Well, as we look on the defensive side, uh, the team kept eight linebackers on the final roster. Seemed a little bit heavy to me. W- what are your thoughts there? It's really heavy. Um, I, uh, I'm not so sure that the Vikings sort of knew what they were, were going to do, uh, you know, when it came down to cuts. And, you know, they probably just did sort of, a player evaluation instead of a roster evaluation. They figured that, you know, Michael Motti and Brandon Watts, they're better players mm-hmm. uh, based off of what they've evaluated than, than someone like Alan Reisner, or even if Alan Reisner offers more positional value as the third tight end versus an eighth linebacker. Right. Uh, this is obviously not going to be the final 
roster for the Vikings as they head into the season, I expect a linebacker is probably going to end up getting cut. I don't think they relish making that decision. Uh, if not, it's probably going to be an offensive lineman. Same thing, without a backup tackle, I wouldn't relish that decision. I think that what's going to end up happening is going to be surprising regardless, just because of, you know, we know that Watts is a good special team. We know that Larry Dean's a good special team, or everyone knows basically sort of the potential that Mahdi has. And so anything is going to be painful. As to whether or not this was, you know, expected on my end, no. Mm-hmm. Um, and I predicted that the Vikings would keep seven linebackers on the roster, which I thought was pretty heavy. Eight was uh, was well outside of my predictive capacity. Yeah, you know, you, you hit it right on the head. The, the very last question I had for you today was, looking at this roster, it's probably not settled. Who would you think are the most likely candidates to be taken off this roster as they search that waiver wire? I think that the most likely candidates are probably Larry Dean, who I think was not as good at special teams last year as he was the year before. I think Brandon Watts can replicate a lot of what he does. Uh, I think after that, Vlad Dukas, who was horrible, he was absolutely abysmal for the New York Jets, has been pretty reasonable, I think, for the Vikings. But I think that they would prefer to keep Yankee or Berger over him. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of that, I think that, you know, with nine offensive linemen, you know, uh, probably at some point someone's going to go. So I think those are the most likely candidates. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it ended up being two linebackers. I really doubt uh, any more cornerbacks were cut, and I, I can't see where else you'd make a cut if you weren't going to cut Christian Ponder. I guess, I guess Zach Line, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Zach Line also. Yeah, and, and by the way, you said it could be two linebackers. If it were somebody besides Dean, who's the next guy on your list that you would take out? Oof. Uh, me, I would take out uh, Brandon Watts, but, but he's consistently proven me wrong when the coaches like him. My guess is that they would more likely take out uh, Michael Motti. Okay. which is unfortunate. Okay, fair enough. Well, we'll watch the waiver wire along with you and see what happens. And Arif, we really appreciate you breaking down the roster moves that happened today. And folks, Arif is one of the hardest working men in sports journalism, so I want to make sure uh, our fans know the many places you can catch his NFL stories and updates. Arif's work can be found on vikingsterritory.com, Vikings Journal, Optimum Scouting, and the Daily Norseman, as well as other places. And you can also follow Arif on Twitter, at Arif Hassan NFL. Arif, again, thanks for joining us today on VikeFans.com. Yeah, thanks for having me. You bet.